So here we're going to talk about the labor market model and why we don't use uh, just a supply and demand model like a lot of economics textbooks do. So in the labor market, uh, the workers supply labor and the firms demand labor. So we could just use supply and demand and talk about a market clearing wage and a market clearing level of employment. Uh, but the model of the labor market that we introduced in uh, chapter six was all about paying workers more than you have to in order to get a higher level of effort. So in that case, there's always going to be some people who would like to have jobs uh, but do not have jobs, and they're going to be uh, what the book refers to as involuntarily unemployed. So let's look at our uh, model of the labor market. So on the horizontal axis, we're going to have the number of employed. So going from you know, 0 to 10 or uh, 0 to 100 percent, right? Now, usually most people are going to be employed, but there will always be some unemployed. Now we're going to have two curves uh, that are added to this model. The first is the wage curve that we introduced in Chapter 6. And that gives us the wage that firms will pay uh, in order to get a certain level of effort at each unemployment rate. So remember, when the unemployment rate is higher, they don't have to pay as much because the employment rent for each worker is higher. So they're going to work harder. They don't want to lose their job because it's going to take them longer to find a new job. The profit curve is the wage uh, that firms will choose in order to maximize uh, their profits. And so you can see that the profit curve actually determines the real wage. Um, but I think this model is hiding something a little bit. And so we're going to talk about that as we build the model up. So when we're at an equilibrium, we can think of that as uh, the Nash equilibrium between workers and firms. So remember, a Nash equilibrium, if you don't know what it is, you can review it from chapter four. But basically, it's just a mutual best response. Given what you're doing, I can't do any better. And given what I'm doing, you can't do any better. And so here we're talking about the employees and the employers. And so what we want to think about is, all right, well, what happens when there are some sort of shocks to the system and how is the market going to adjust, right? So if we have uh, a shift in the labor market, for example, um, in, we get an increase in, in labor or a decrease in labor, that's going to shift our wage curve. Um, and if we get a change in the profit curve, then we'll move along. And so we'll do exam move along the wage curve. We'll do examples of both of those. So let's start with labor productivity. So what does this mean, labor productivity? It's how much each worker produces, right? So output per worker. If we're talking about the real wage in terms of dollars per hour, it would be output per hour. If we're talking about in terms of annual salary, it would be output um, per year. So we've got some measure of labor productivity. Now, if the labor market were perfectly competitive and the product markets were perfectly competitive, we would expect uh, the wage to equal labor productivity. But most markets are not perfectly competitive, um, and especially the labor market. And so firms are going to be able to uh, charge some price for their product above their cost, right? And that's known as their markup. And so the distance between the profit curve and labor productivity is how much profit the firms get per hour. And then, of course, the distance from zero to the real wage is just the real wage per worker. So you can think of it like, all right, if I'm a worker and I'm producing uh, $30 of output per hour, and I'm getting paid $20 per hour, then my real wage is $20 per hour and my real profit per worker is uh, $10 per hour, right? 30 minus 20. So that distance, that real profit per worker comes from the firm's markups, the fact that they don't just have to ch uh, charge uh, price equal to marginal cost like you may have done in a perfect competition model uh, in um, uh, microeconomics. So now we've actually already determined the real wage, right? We know what the real wage is, which comes from labor productivity and the profit curve. But we don't know how many workers are working yet. And for that, we need the wage curve. 
And so the intersection of the wage curve and the profit curve tells us how many people are employed and how many people are unemployed. That's our equilibrium, right? And so it's an equilibrium that always has some excess supply, right? Always some excess supply of labor. Uh, that can get sort of bigger and smaller depending on the business cycle. We're going to talk about that um, later in the course. Uh, but there's always some people who are unemployed. So here's our labor supply. And you can see the distance between uh, the dotted blue line and the wage curve along the profit curve gives us the number of people who are involuntarily unemployed. So in this case, we have 9 million employed people at point A and out of 10 million people who would like to work. And so we have 1 million people who are involuntarily unemployed. So now what happens if there's a new profit curve, right? For example, if there's a higher markup. Now, why would we have a higher markup? Well, there could be a number of reasons, right? But it's going to be some sort of increase in rent. It could be innovation rent, in which case firms uh, invent a new product uh, and they're able to charge a higher price. Uh, it could be sort of uh, anti-competitive rents, right? In which case, because there are fewer competitors, firms can charge a higher price and so their markup increases. Now, the real wage falls in this case, right? We move along the wage curve from point A to point B and more people become unemployed. And so there is some concern in the United States right now that uh, we're seeing a decrease in competition in a lot of industries and that is in turn increasing firms markups, increasing their profit. Now, one thing to note, we see the real wage fall as we move from point A to point B. That doesn't necessarily mean that the nominal wage falls. And so we're gonna talk about this difference between nominal and real a little bit more when we talk about inflation. But nominal wage is just how much you're paid in dollars per hour, right? Where the real wage tells you how much you can buy. And so your real wage can fall if either your nominal wage falls and prices stay the same, or if your nominal wage stays the same, but prices go up. And so in this case, with the higher markup, firms are able to increase their prices. And so the uh, prices for goods that workers are buying goes up, which means that their real wage falls. It doesn't necessarily mean that their nominal wage falls, right? It could be exactly the same. So if we get a change in the profit curve, we would expect a fall in the real wage and an increase in the number of unemployed. That said, if we can increase competition in the market, then the profit curve would move up towards labor productivity as the markup shrank. The real wage would go up. Maybe the nominal wage stays the same and prices just fall, but we would have fewer people uh, unemployed. All right, so now what happens if we get an increase in labor supply, right? So this is another example uh, where, you know, what's gonna happen? Is it gonna shift the profit curve or is it gonna shift the wage curve? So in this case, we would expect uh, the wage curve to increase in the long run. It might take a little bit of time for that to happen. Um, but for example, what we don't see is that as countries are growing really fast, they necessarily have uh, a higher unemployment rate. So if you're adding a lot of population, you don't necessarily see the unemployment rate go up, um, at least not in the long run. If it's through a higher birth rate, sometimes you will see a higher unemployment rate um, for a while, but that's usually because the younger, uh, younger people tend to be more unemployed than older people. So if you have a lot of people between, say, 15 and 25 years old, you're going to have more of them be unemployed. So in this case, we would get a shift in the wage curve, right? And so what would happen is that we would start, we start at this real wage, we get a shift out in the wage curve, and initially, right, we would see a lower real wage. That wouldn't be too surprising. But then, uh, as the economy adjusts and as we grow, we move from point B to point C and we move back to our profit curve, right? Because there are gonna be more firms uh, that are created, there's gonna be more job opportunities, and as long as competition is the same and the markup is the same and productivity is the same, then we'll move back to point C uh, and the number of employed will move from 9 to 9.9 .9 million. The unemployment rate should be more or less the same as it was before. So it's important to remember the differences between a market 
for a good like bread and a market for workers, right? For employers and employees. Um, so this is just a table from the book. I'm not going to go through it all. Uh, you can look at it in, in chapter nine. Um, but remember that the price in, in the labor market is the wage um, and workers can change their uh, effort level, can change how they respond to the wage, um, unlike a loaf of bread, right? So that's an important thing to remember that workers, uh, you know, as human beings are different than other types of goods and services. So another thing to remember is that as we discussed in chapter six, because we have incomplete contracts and because firms choose to pay efficiency wages, uh, we end up with involuntary unemployment, right? Now, that's always going to be the case because of these incomplete contracts. It's not necessarily due to government policies or trade unions or high wages. Um, that's not to say that government policies can't cause an increase in unemployment, um, but it's not going to be the main cause in most uh, modern industrial economies. Um, it's really all about these employment rents, right? And workers uh, don't want to lose those employment rents, and so they're willing to work harder the larger are those rents.